Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and thanks for joining us for another hour of answering your gardening questions. You can talk to one of our phone volunteers for answers tonight. Dial 1-800-676-5446. If you have pictures to share and it can wait for a future show, send us an email to byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can. Do be sure also to check out our YouTube channel. Follow us during the week on Facebook. And of course, we have samples to start with. And Kyle, uh-oh. Emerald ash borer, I yes. bet. Yes, yep, emerald ash borer. So um, I wanted to bring some examples. We get a lot of questions about, um, you know, people see damage in, in their ash, um, see boring, and, and they want to know if it's emerald ash borer. So I wanted to bring some examples to really demonstrate that. So uh, the beetles, the adults, are these really rather small metallic green beetles, um, only about half of an inch. So most people are relatively um, are surprised at how relatively small they are um, and the amount of damage they can do. They'll emerge in the spring, uh, these adults, um, <clears throat> and the, they'll mate, they'll fly up to the top of the tree, eat the leaves, mate, and then females will lay eggs on the bark and those larvae will, will tunnel into, uh, into the tree. And so uh, when the, the adults emerge, they produce these really characteristic uh, D-shaped holes. Um, it's, it's rather small. They're only about an, an eighth of an inch. But um, you can see kind of there's that flat, flat surface on top, and then it's rounded on the bottom. So that's really characteristic uh, in the bark of, of emerald ash borer. And sometimes um, if you're seeing some smallish holes, um, you know, sometimes they will get a little bit um, you know, it's kind of misshapen as, as they're older. And so you can kind of cut that back maybe a little bit uh, with a knife and see if it has that characteristic D shape. So that's one of the things to look for. Um, otherwise, signs that, that your trees could be infested with emerald ash borer um, include uh, canopy de decline, especially in that upper third, um, suckering around the trunk of the tree, uh, cracks that will um, go vertical in the tree. Those can also be indications. Uh, from where they've been tunneling, and then um, <clears throat> woodpecker activity. So if you're seeing those signs, you see those D-shaped holes, um, another really characteristic sign, if you pull back the bark, is going to be these serpentine galleries, um, or kind of zigzagging galleries going back and forth. Very characteristic for emerald ash borer. Our native borers, they tend to um, sort of have more meandering galleries, um, not serpentine like this, or they bore um, deeper into the wood, into the heartwood, uh, whereas emerald ash borer really stay uh, in the phloem, uh, the very sort of, just, just right underneath the bark. So things to look for, if you are seeing um, any indication of emerald ash borer, um, I, I would suggest uh, speaking to a certified uh, arborist, um, somebody that can help make decisions on, on whether that tree should be treated, if it's one that you even want to treat, um, and help you uh, make those treatments if necessary. All right, thanks Kyle. <laughs> Matt, death became yeah, whatever that yeah. is. <clears throat> if there's one thing I hate more, it's weeds. When I spray them, they don't die. Uh, so like if you're using a product like, let's say, glyphosate or Roundup by itself, and you're trying to kill some weeds, uh, usually it's going to be you know, like a five to 10 day period of where that weed is actually absorbing that chemical and killing it. Uh, so there's a lot of ready to use products out there that contain glyphosate, but they also contain other products such as uh, contact herbicides that basically kill what they touch. They don't translocate. Uh, so a couple of these here, Roundup 1 has uh, pelargonic acid in it, so it's a contact that basically burns through the plant and kills whatever it touches. And then here's another one called Pulverize. Never really used it much, but it's got ammoniated salt, uh, soap uh, of a fatty acid in it, so it's really quick. It almost burns the plant when it gets on it. Uh, it does better when the temperatures are hotter. Uh, so it's, it's safe to use near plants, but it's going to kill whatever it touches. So you want to make sure that you're spraying it directly on the plant that you want to kill. Uh, and if you do it correctly, uh, some of these products work really fast. I actually sprayed this one two hours ago. So here's one that wasn't sprayed, and here's one that was sprayed. And you can see where I sprayed it, the foliage just turned black and is pretty much going to be dead by tomorrow morning, hopefully. Uh, so there's some products out there that work a lot better. Uh, another one that works well, uh, I think uh, Diquat. So glyphosate Roundup product does carry one with Diquat in it. And that is another product that is a contact. So it kills only, it doesn't translocate like glyphosate does. 
uh, so it's going to kill the plant fast and it's only going to work to the ground level. But usually, if the plants are young enough, it's going to kill the entire plant, even the root system, just because that plant's going to die so fast. Um, so there are options out there. I don't like spraying products that don't work fast because I hate seeing them for the next week. So uh, check out some of these that have those uh, contact herbicides in them. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right, Lauren, a dead something. So usually something dead in front of me <laughs> on the show. Uh, we get a lot of questions on Backyard Farmer about uh, a, a shrub or something that has a branch that maybe isn't performing well or overall uh, an impact on a, a, some sort of deciduous material. Uh, I brought along tonight, this is a, a, a limb from a Nanking cherry that I could see was, was dying suddenly. And uh, a lot of times we say follow that branch down and we'll see if we can zoom in on this. You can see just some um, little droplets here which is... Uh, some of the pitch droplets from there where we have a fungus that's infecting this area uh, throughout here. And then that's one of the signs that we see that infection. So this is something to look for. Um, in this particular case, brown rot is a very common disease of, of many of our stone fruits. We see it in apricot, peach, nanking cherry. Uh, it's fungal, so we would say go down below this affected area about three to five inches and prune that out. All right, thank you, Lauren. Okay, Sarah. Well, I brought some cat with cattails with me tonight, Kim, and um, you know, cattails can be very pretty um, in a in a wetland area or in a ditch, but sometimes they can be quite invasive and they can really take over too. So, what I wanted to talk about tonight was how to control them mechanically. So, there was some research done back in Iowa in the '70s about cutting back the foliage of cattails, and they found that if you cut the foliage back two or three times during the summer. Um, ideally below the water line in the pond, um, then you could have in just one season, you could get about 90 or 95% control of the cattails themselves. Um, it also works in the winter though. So if you, if you cut the cattails down, again, below the water line, and then they're, they're underwater all winter, you can also get a pretty good rate of kill um, on those plants, about 80%. So um, uh, if you have the ability to adjust the water level in your pond, what you can do is, to, is cut them down as close as you can and then allow the water level, level to rise so that the, um, the cut surfaces of the stems are at least about three inches below the water. But that's a good way to control cattails without using any chemicals. So um, it would be a nice way to do it and be safe to the environment too. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Sickle right. in a swimming suit. That's Sounds right. like fun right <laughs> Or there. some hip waders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feel good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, Kyle, uh, two pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Concord, Nebraska, switchgrass. And uh, she says one of the plants is totally devastated. She thinks it's grasshoppers. And is she right? And is diatomaceous <coughs> earth an option for controlling grasshoppers? I, I agree. It, it probably looks like it's grasshoppers. Um, switchgrass is, is pretty tough and doesn't have a lot of um, you know, major insect pests. So as far as, as control, diatomaceous earth, um, there has been some work with grasshoppers. It has shown, at least in lab settings, that it can have some efficacy. Um, the silica basically, you know, sort of uh, breaks down the mandibles and gut, but it's not going to be very, very quick. So I don't know if that would necessarily be the best option on, on that devastated plant, at least. Um, if you're wanting to treat that, I would probably go with carbaryl. Um, but, you know, keep in mind that controlling adult grasshoppers is really hard anyways. And, you know, you, you may not get, get the greatest control because they're so mobile. All right. You have one picture on this next one. This is a Lincoln viewer. First year planting Brussels sprouts. She doesn't know what's eating them, covered in holes, even with a net. So what, what eats those Brussels? Yeah, the, well, there's a bunch of things, but I'm, I'm guessing based on uh, the injury there, I, I think this is um, like cabbage looper or maybe uh, imported cabbage worm um, that will, will feed on plants in that family. Um, both of them can be controlled um, similarly. So um, in, in small plantings, either one, you can just go out and hand pick, um, look for those. Um, that's oftentimes the easiest thing if you're only dealing with a few plants. Um, otherwise, um, BT can be effective for, for young um, caterpillars. 
Um, some of that damage makes me think they might be a little bit larger though, so in that case, spinosad would be um, maybe a better option. All right, thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> All right, uh, Matt, two pictures on this first one. Uh, he says this occurs every summer when it turns hot in June. The grass that dies has very shallow roots, then it suddenly turns green again when temps get cooler and the dead grass disappears. This has been happening for years. He wonders, is this poa annua? Uh, it's not poa annua, but it is a poa. It's rough bluegrass, so it's poa trivialis. Uh, and this one is very typical to die during the summer. So it does really well in cool. Uh, it likes the cool weather, I should say. And it even likes shade pretty well. But when we get into these hot temps, uh, it doesn't like heat and it gets diseased very easily. And it needs a lot of water to stay alive. So those three things are pretty uh, hard to come by this time of year. And it'll die off. And what you're seeing there is that straw color. Uh, it's it's grows by stone, so it kind of makes a mat on top of the top of the soil. So it'll just kind of spread in patches, and then it looks like it's spread throughout most of the lawn. So one way to try and get rid of this would be to overseed it with a better grass, maybe a tall fescue or a bluegrass, and maybe even raise the mowing height to three inches to try and have the other grass outcompete the rough bluegrass when it's coming back in September. All right, thanks, Matt. Two pictures on this next one. This is also dead grass. This is Omaha. Uh, what is causing this? Plenty of sun, green this spring, brown in July, no insects, hasn't been treated for grubs, and the front yard didn't have it. So any ideas? Uh, I'm thinking this is the same. It could be the same issue with the same type of grass just going dormant this time of year. Um, it also could be, if it's getting watered heavily, there could be some disease issues in there every summer, just from the way that it's facing on that, it could be south slope or, uh, mm -hmm. and it's just burning up. So it might not be the correct type of grass for that situation. And it might just be, uh, you know, a wheat grass as well. If it's rough bluegrass, it's going to do that every year. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right, Lauren, your first one, uh, is... Are these black spots caused by insects, or is this a rot in the spot? <laughs> I, I believe this is bacterial speck on tomato, uh, Kim. Mm -hmm. And that's one that, um, when it's established in there, it may be difficult to manage, just try to avoid overhead irrigation. Uh, you can use copper sprays, but be really careful because our high temperatures now, you're gonna burn your foliage really bad. Uh, so just for now, I would say, uh, you know, also try to minimize contact because it will, you will spread it that way as well. All right, um, and your next two actually come to us from different parts of the state, but they look <laughs> the same. They're like Rembrandt tomatoes, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> this one's from Omaha, the next one is Ord. Yeah, and I, I believe in both cases, this is tomato spotted wilt virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that will spread from one plant to the other. So if you have a lot of tomatoes in your garden, and just one that's doing this, I'd recommend roguing it out. If it's the only one, Enjoy it and see how it tastes. It won't be the same flavor, but it may still be okay. But it's still edible. <laughs> still edible. <laughs> right. Thanks. Sarah, uh, two pictures on this first one. This is uh, the first, we have a grafted apple from a Johnny Appleseed tree. Gets paler and paler. The second is a rootstock that didn't take the graft, so they're just letting it grow. This is uh, Magnolia, which is north of the Less Hills in Iowa. What, what do we think here? <clears throat> so I'm wondering if this homeowner is fertilizing because apple trees do need um, a regular fertilization for them to do well. Um, I think the question they also mentioned, they had some other trees that looked fine and it was just mm -hmm. these two that were having the problems. Um, so there can be some micronutrient deficiencies too that we see in all trees, including apples. Um, there's a really good publication from Colorado State on fertilizing apples, and you might want to Google that. They talk about the amount of um, chelated iron to add to improve yellowing like this in apples, and then they also give you just kind of general fertilization recommendations for apples. So I would check that out. It's, it's a nutrient problem that you're dealing with. All right, excellent. Uh, and one picture on this next one. This is north of North Platte. This is a tree growing. He's seen many that get trimmed up so they can mow and irrigate under it. Would we recommend that? And if so, when? <laughs> I personally would not recommend that. Um, I like trees, I like evergreens specifically to be limbed all the way to the ground. I think it looks more natural the way that they would grow in a natural setting. Some people really like the look of trees limbed up. Um, it doesn't necessarily hurt the health of the tree. 
Uh, so if you prefer that look, you can do it. Um, ideally, I'd say the very best time of year to trim off those branches would be during the dormant season. So that would be from November to about early March if, if you want to limit up. All right. Don't Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> don't, don't do it. <laughs> right. Well, as we start harvesting our vegetables around this time, it also makes sense that you use that extra available space to plant something that might mature quickly, be ready to harvest before the frost date. Here to tell us more about fall gardening is Elizabeth. One of the more common gardening times of the year is going to be fall gardening. Now it's a time of year that a lot of people forget they can actually be planting crops for later in the season. We're nearing the peak of the summer season when it comes to vegetable gardening and right now we're going to have some empty spots out in our garden. Now is a perfect time to go ahead and intercede with some other cool season crops or with some other crops that we want to grow in our garden. When we talk about fall gardening, we need to make sure that we check on the seed packet to see what the days till harvest is. Then we add 14 days to that days till harvest. And depending on if it's a tender crop or it's a hardy crop, then we would add more time to it. So if it's a tender crop that doesn't like frost, we're gonna add 14 more days to that days till harvest. If it's a hardy crop, let's say one of the cool season crops that can handle that light frost like kale, then we would just go with the straight 14 days added on to that. So it really makes a difference. We need to read the backs of the labels to see what our days till harvest are and then add that buffer to it. In western Nebraska, you're going to bump your frost date up sooner into October. And so it really depends on what part of the state you're living in, what that average frost date is. It'll make a big difference if we're doing those tender crops versus those a little bit hardier crops that can handle that light frost. When we take a look at fall gardening, we also need to determine how deep we need to plant the seeds. That's also on the back of the package. And because we are looking at warmer temperatures, we might wanna plant those seeds just a little deeper than we normally would or what's recommended on the package. Because we're in the heat of the summer, we also need to make sure that we provide that supplemental water. And we need to do very light waterings to make sure that that soil stays moist so those seeds can break through. We wanna make sure that we avoid that crust forming on top of that soil surface. Otherwise, those seeds are gonna have a tough time germinating up through that. There's a lot of different crops that we can do fall gardening with. We can do our green beans, we can do our leafy greens like our lettuce and our spinach and our kale. If you have the transplants available, we can also do our cool season crops like our broccoli and our cauliflower. So it really depends on what you want in your garden, what you're gonna be planting this time of the year. This is just common sense and good gardening to use that space to grow something good for later in the season. And as you clean out the matured uh, produce, get something going that you can enjoy later. Make sure that that is clean matured produce so it doesn't put all of Lauren's rats and spots and Kyle's insects in the compost pile. Just leave it all there and enjoy what happens. <laughs> you could do that and too. And fight it yeah. next year. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Kyle, uh, one picture on this first one. Mm. This is a viewer who says she is from Omaha and Wenatchee, Washington. So two places, but she wants to know what this insect is on an unripened plum fruit. Yeah, this is, um, or at least was, um, uh, a pupa of a, a ladybug. So it's already emerged from that. You can see kind of at the bottom side, it's, it's come out. But um, when they, they pupate, they glue themselves to a substrate. And, um, and so that's what was here. This is the exuvia or remaining caskin. Fun. All right. Uh, one picture on this next one. This comes to us from Seward. What are these on the green beans and how do we get rid of them? So these look like dark wing fungus gnats. Um, and the, the adults are really not a problem. They don't feed on anything. They're not going to feed on the plants. Um, they're, they're a nuisance and we tend to see these more um, like indoors with, with house plants. Um, and so the, the larvae, as the name implies, are generally associated with, with fungus um, and sometimes other decaying organic matter. There are a few species that do feed on plant roots, but it's not really a common problem here. Um, so, you know, really control of these is generally about, um, you know, controlling the moisture. They really like wet 
um, high organic uh, matter in, in the soil. And so sort of controlling that, the, the amount of organic matter, um, reducing water if it's overwatered, um, having well-drained soil, those are sort of the things that you can do to help, help manage those. Okay, and just flick them off. Yep, yeah, the okay. adults. Or eat just, them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I suppose a little extra protein. <laughs> All right, Matt. Your first one. You have one picture here. Uh, this is um, one that is a thick bladed. They're calling it a grass type of weed. They've pulled and pulled. How do you get rid of it? And this comes to us from Hastings. Uh, the answer is you don't get rid of it. <laughs> it is yellow nut sedge. It's not yeah. a grass. It's a sedge, and it does have that light green appearance. Uh, if you cut it at the stem, it's going to have a triangular shape, and that identifies it as being a sedge. Uh, one thing you could do now, if you wanted to, although it probably only has one more month of growing before it kind of slows down when the temps start getting cooler and we start getting freezes. Uh, so if you apply a product that controls yellow nut sedge, it's really not going to control it for next year because it already created tubers underground, so it's going to be coming up next year. But it will be growing for the next month, so if you treat it with a product like Sedge Hammer, you're probably going to have to wait about two weeks, one to two weeks, before it actually starts working. Uh, anything with sulfentrazone in it uh, will do a little bit faster, and it'll burn it down. And then next year, plan on applying something to control those earlier, like in, let's say, first week of June. Uh, you might not even see it yet, but sulfentrazone does have uh, soil activity, so you can use that product earlier. And then Sedge Hammer works as well, uh, which is halo sulfuron, and that one works as well. All right, thanks, Matt. You have two pictures on this next one. This is the annual yellowing of the bluegrass, and she says it's <clears throat> one area, they get full sun. She's tried to water less frequently. She's used a, a, a four-step program. She's trying this mineral supplement, and it's still doing this. Yeah, it is. Uh, Every year, pretty much, in those, especially in irrigated areas, it seems to be worse. Uh, it seems like those nutrient, especially iron uh, deficiency or iron chlorosis, is very common, especially when we get into that heat of the summer and iron becomes uh, unavailable to the plant. So you could look at a couple things. Uh, take a soil test to uh, check your pH of your soil. Uh, if it is a high pH, uh, iron is less available to the plant, so there would be amendments like sulfur to lower the pH to make iron more available. If this is happening every year, maybe that'd be the first step. Uh, secondly, I don't know if it's all the same grass throughout the lawn or if that's a different type that's turning green. Um, so tall fescue would be one that if you want to get rid of it, plant tall fescue doesn't have that yellowing uh, characteristic as bluegrass does because the roots are deeper. <coughs> iron isn't as big of a problem with tall fescue. Um, other than that, if you're applying iron already, that's the right step. Uh, maybe just a little bit more. All right, thanks, Matt. Lauren, two pictures on this one. This is, uh, again, a red bud. This one's two years old. First year it had mottled leaves. <coughs> this year they look mottled still, and I think our second picture shows the modeling, and we keep going back and forth on this. Yeah, and, and we've seen quite a few red bud mm -hmm. issues this summer. and. Uh, Kim, and in this case, again, I, I really don't feel this is a disease. I think mm -hmm. some of this is just extreme heat, uh, possibly drier soils, uh, could be some nutrient deficiency with that, with limited uptake. Uh, but I haven't seen many of them that I would associate with an actual disease. So I would just, just watch the plant and make sure it's getting adequate moisture uh, and see how it comes out next year. All right, and the reminder that they like the shade. Yeah, this full sun, <laughs> that full sun, sometimes too long a brick yes. line or something. That's really hot for a red bud. Right. Especially okay. a little one. Yep. Okay, we have three pictures on this one. This is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, currants, and she, uh, transplanted in 21. She's harvested currants, but this one has slowly started to do this, mm. slowly dying. Uh, she's wondering about the decline on, on the currants here. And I think in this case, it may be something that that first uh, sample I was showing to follow those canes down, see mm -hmm. if you see anything at the base. Uh, it could simply be some crown and root rot going on in there as you're getting that overall plant decline and some of those larger branches dying out. So you could prune some of those out, uh, but it, it really does sound like, and I think she indicated she lost one additional one last year. It may be time just to kind of refresh things here. All right, thanks. Uh, Sarah, you have one picture on this first one. Uh, this comes to us from Niobrara. 
Cuxol came from what she thought was the same plant. Now she did a little bit of follow-up on it and she discovered that the white ones came from a different plant. So let's talk about so <laughs> seeds there, in the packet. <laughs> there, there are some cultivars of cucumbers which are naturally have skin this color, which, mm -hmm. are, which are white skinned cucumbers. Mm -hmm. so, um, so a couple of possible, possible uh, option, or, uh, theories here. Like Kim mentioned, you could have gotten some stray seed in whatever packet of seed you bought that was um, not the true cultivar that you were purchasing that was this white colored cucumber. If you have grown cucumbers in this place in your garden in the past, it could be that you had um, uh, your, your plants set seed, that you, maybe you had some cucumbers you left on the ground, those plants grew, and you got some genetic recombination and you ended up with a white skin cucumber that, you know, that looked like this. Um, so those are probably the most likely uh, causes of this. Right. But they're edible, they're, they're just yeah. fine, so go ahead and eat them. <laughs> All right, one picture on this one, this comes to us from Ralston. He said this is a volunteer sugar kiss cantaloupe that uh, put on a little fruit. He's wondering should he support the fruit so it's not in contact with the ground to avoid rot spots and insects. So it looks like there's a pretty good layer of mulch underneath the melon right now, which is just fine. I mean, you just don't want the melon to be in contact with wet soil where you could maybe get some uh, soil-borne insects t uh, burrowing up into it or, or cause any um, fruit rots or anything on that side that's sitting on the ground. If, if, so I would just check to make sure that you have a nice kind of little bed of mulch there that it's laying on, that it's not in a wet area, and that would be just fine. Um, you don't actually have to pull it completely up off the ground uh, for it to grow and develop well. All right, and one more, and this one is a uh, downtown Omaha viewer. He grows loofah gourds, uh, but he's saying lots of vine, no flowers. Heat? Possibly, although I, I would expect that the, the viewer would have seen some flowers, uh, and they have a bright yellow flower, so they're kind of hard <clears throat> to miss. Uh, the heat could certainly account for them not setting fruits because heat um, messes with pollination all the time and we've had plenty of heat to do that. So um, if you have seen flowers but the flowers are not setting, then it's probably an environmental problem related to the heat. If you're not seeing any flowers at all, then I would, I, my first suspicion would be maybe this, the ground has too much nitrogen in it and so that's causing the plant to be very vigorous vegetatively but not to um, uh, put out any flowers. All right, thanks Sarah. Well, we have another event on UNLZ's campus this weekend, and that is a perfect opportunity for you to stop by our garden. Everything is looking fantastic. Here's Terry to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're tidying up our garden, getting ready to invite all of you one last time to East Campus for East Campus Discovery Days. Come by, join us. We'll have lots of master gardeners here. I'll be here to help answer all of your gardening questions. You can stroll through the garden, check out what we have, see our vegetables that are growing, our flowers that are blooming, and all those little bugs that we don't really want and the diseases that we don't really want. But we'll be able to educate you all about them. You can then stroll down to the East Campus Mall and visit lots of other departments, see what they do. Lots of kids activities, so bring the kiddos out, food trucks, music, spend all morning here this Saturday for our last East Campus Discovery Days of 2022. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. All right, Sarah, ready? Ready. <laughs> This viewer, we don't know where they're from, but they said uh, he scored a walnut log and he chipped it and shaved it and he wonders whether he can use those around his plants or in his compost. No. <laughs> so uh, this is a Burwell viewer who wants to know whether they can kill the tree root sprouts all over the lawn without killing the tree. No. And the question is toward on. No, definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a Pilger viewer and several others who have hostas that are the variegated ones. Brown crinkled edges. Is this too much sun or too little water or does this belong to Lauren? It's both. Too much sun and too little water, yeah. All right. Um, several viewers are saying they have tomatoes that are set on, big ones, and they're green, but they're not ripening. What's up with that? Um, I think sometimes the really high heat can set them back from ripening and it can slow it down a little bit. 
So just be patient. Hopefully we get past this hot period, they'll start to, to ripen. All right, we have an Ottawa, Iowa viewer who wonders whether cucumbers are a good choice to plant for a fall garden. Yeah, there are some that have a pretty quick turnaround. All right, we have a La Vista viewer. Whoop, too late. <laughs> we'll save that one just in case. <clears throat> nice job. Okay, Lauren, yours are gonna like be, you know, a paragraph per. That's what I usually Questions. get last week. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready like a fried bologna sandwich tonight, Kim. Oh, mm -hmm. excellent. I love that, and I'm gonna try to do better than last week. All right. <laughs> Your first one is an Omaha viewer who has a, a new bee balm, Menarda, wonders is neem oil a treatment for powdery mildew? You, you can try it. it, it has shown some efficacy, uh, and it, it may work. All Spray right. it with water also, that can help. Okay, we also have an Omaha viewer that has uh, what he's describing as soft rot on the bottom of bell peppers. Is that something to treat or just pull it off? Uh, well, if it's on the bottom, it's most likely blossom and rot, so just make sure you're maintaining adequate moisture. All right, this is a Bennett viewer who wonders whether um, the tops of their eastern red cedar would have died because of a canker or disease or something else. Could have been a canker. All right. This is a viewer who says, what is the clear amber-colored globs on their peach tree trunk and should it be treated? Uh, that's what I was showing earlier with the uh, uh, brown rot on uh, Nanking cherry. All right. It could be the same thing on a peach. A Dixon County viewer wants to know whether potatoes that have these scabby looking things on the skin are okay to eat. Fine to eat, uh, just wash them off. There you go, see, you can do this. Feeling much better tonight than I did last <laughs> week. Thanks for giving me another chance, everybody. <laughs> okay, Matt, are you ready? Yes. Uh, this is a viewer who is actually asking whether they can spray now for weeds when it is this hot. Uh, generally, most things are not safe. Some of them do claim to be safe at that 90 degrees, so just be careful. But I would say either do it earlier in the morning or a little bit later in the afternoon when it's not so hot. All right, this is a Hooper viewer who wonders whether, uh, what is the time frame for a fall application of a pre-emergent? Uh, generally, you would wait, depending on what you're targeting, some of the fall, like winter annuals are gonna be germinating in September, so if you wanna hit those, go earlier. Uh, otherwise, wait if you're wanting to control weeds for next year till whenever, November, All October. Right. All right, and the same viewer wants to know what are the most effective pre-emergent ingredients to look for? Uh, Dithiopyr is one of the newest ones. Uh, Prodiamine is a newer one. Pendimethalin is probably one of the older ones that's been around a long time. So those three work really good. All right, is it a myth to not water the grass in, during the day because of the magnifying glass effect? Uh, it's not a myth. It's, it's better practice to do it early in the morning when it's cooler. If you do do it in the middle of the day, it can actually heat it up and you can do some damage if, if you're not careful or you'll have issues uh, with the grass thinning out. All right, nice job. Okay, Kyle, you ready? I'm ready. Your first one comes to us from a viewer who wants to, uh, from Bellevue who wonders whether spotted lanternfly has been uh, found in Nebraska yet. Um, it has not been, been confirmed in Nebraska, no. All right, uh, this is a viewer also who said, as we recommended last week, they pulled out all their beans with spider mites. Now they're wondering whether they need to treat the soil before they replant. No, you don't, you don't treat the soil. All right, uh, we have a viewer who wonders whether using eight on squash bugs on zucchini will hurt tomatoes and will it kill the squash bugs? Um, yes, it, it will uh, help with the squash bugs, fine for the tomatoes. All right, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who wonders what is the best control for those huge grass, they're calling them grasshopper-like things that fly. Um, grass, I guess. It's probably big grasshoppers. If, if, if it's big yeah. grasshoppers, probably carbaryl is, is the best. All right, this is a Denton viewer who says they have little small holes in the trunk of their red oak tree. Are those borers potentially? Yeah, I would guess it's some type of a bore. Probably the tree's declining. All right, nice job, all. We had 
<laughs> five, 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 and four. Hey, Matt, I remember what it, I know what it feels like. That happened to me last week. That's all right. No, you only yeah. had like two. I think I'm. Yeah, I know. It was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's two and really everybody bad. else had six. It was really bad, yeah. <laughs> okay, Sarah, what are our plants of the week? Well, um, you know, oftentimes when we think about clematis, we think of vining plants, but there are some bush forms of clematis, and this happens to be one of those. This is a bush type called uh, China Purple. Gets to be about three to four feet tall and about the same in width. Mm -hmm. And um, beautiful purple flowers. And it's a pretty tough plant, so it will do well, you know, uh, in, in, in pretty difficult conditions once it uh, gets established. <coughs> so this is China Purple Clematis. And then we also have a grass here in the back. This is a uh, big blue stem, which is flowering. And um, uh, big blue stem also has the common name of turkey foot. And you can kind of understand that because of the shape of these seed heads. It kind of looks like a turkey's foot. So uh, uh, big blue stem is quite beautiful in the fall, you know, um, as the, the greens change color. And uh, one of our great taller native grasses. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yep. All righty. Kyle, two pictures on this first one. And we have a lot of pictures in these next rounds. So uh, this is a bur oak, 30 years, 30 to 40 feet tall. He sent a bunch of pictures, and what he's seeing is the, the leaves being clipped, and I think your second one is the end of the twig. He doesn't see any chewing. He just sees, and off it comes. Yeah, this, um, the second one really, I think, suggests it's, it's uh, twig pruner. Mm -hmm. um, so these have actually like a two-year life cycle. And they tend to be more abundant in the odd-numbered years. So we, we see these really commonly in, in oak, less so in, in even-numbered years. But um, I think that's what it is still. Um, and it's really characteristic because what they do is the, um, the egg is laid at the end of the, the twig. They tunnel inside, um, develop in there. And then when they're ready to, to pupate after a couple of years, they, uh, the larvae inside kind of... Uh, eat in this concentric ring, kind of hollowing out, making that concave shape inside there, but then just leave the bark intact and then eventually that breaks off with wind or whatever. So um, it makes that really characteristic shape at, at the end of the twig and then the hole in the center. So they're not really a, a problem. It's mostly cosmetic. They shouldn't hurt the, the oak tree at all. And there's not really much you can do. Um, really the the recommendation is, um, you know, picking up those twigs um, and destroying them as they fall throughout the fall and, and winter. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Three picks on this next one. Uh, this is a lilac in Bennington. <clears throat> Had a dead limb when he inspected it. He found insect damage. He found some frass or sawdust. Then he, he thought it was a shell, but he thinks it's an ash lilac borer. What yep. do you think? Yeah, I agree. This looks uh, like characteristic lilac or ash borer. Um, so this is an underwing moth, and um, they, they tunnel, they, they bore into um, the stems. They like to go um, near the soil level um, and you know, up a few feet from there. And so um, <clears throat> their tunneling will make these you know, kind of um, bulging lesions, um, very characteristic damage that was shown in that first picture. And then the last image was, looked like the sort of the pupil case that is usually stuck still in the, in the trunk. But um, control of these, you have to um, spray the trunk where they're, they're boring in. Um, and you have to do that in the, the sp kind of spring, early summer when the adults emerge. Um, so it would be like May when you would go out and treat, um, treat with a pyrethroid product like a bifenthrin. Um, and you need to spray all the way down to the soil level around that trunk um, up about six feet at least. All right, excellent. Uh, your next one comes to us from Hastings. There's one picture here. What's eating the holes, uh, holes in the flower buds of the once beautiful geraniums? <laughs> yeah, this is a tobacco budworm, mm -hmm. and um, they, they do like geraniums quite a bit. And um, another one that's really hard to control in geraniums because, because of the fact they're feeding in those buds, they're, they're pretty well protected. Um, at night, though, they do like to kind of hide around the base or soil or excuse me, during the day they like to do that and then they come up to feed at night. So if it's a small planting, um, hand picking can be a good option. Um, you'd need to go out late evening or you know, after dark with a flashlight um, and you can pick a lot of those off. Um, otherwise, again, um, spinosad is, is an option. A lot of geraniums, especially in the buds, it's not as big of an issue with pollinators, but you still want to be sort of careful with, with what you're spraying around those plants. Um, spinosad, uh, if you apply that um, in the evening after pollinators are active, it's, it's fine. Once it dries, it has uh, virtually no toxicity to, to pollinators. 
All right, and one more, and this is, uh, he just wonders what this is. Uh, evergreen, our friend the Eastern uh, Evergreen uh, Bagworm. So, yep, they're um, too late to, to treat for it now. Um, at this point, it's hand picking. All right, thank you. All right, Matt, uh, first question here. This is north of North Platte. And he said bright yellow flowers in the fall, then sharp needles that he is cleaning up in November. What is this? Yeah, I've never really seen this one very often, I should say, but I think it's Spanish needles uh, or like a beggar's tick, similar. Uh, so it, once it flowers, its seeds turn into these pokey things. And when you walk through there, they stick to your jeans, to your shirt, to your socks, and they're a big pain to get out. So if there's a way to treat them now, I would treat them now before they set seed. Um, it might be a little late, but next year, plan on spraying uh, broadleaf, most broadleaf herbicide should work on that. Just be careful what you're spraying them around. All right, uh, one on this next one, and this uh, this is a weed ID. Any idea on this one? I think this one is evening primrose. Even though it kind of looks a little bit different, that's the closest ID I could come with a picture. Uh, so that would be a native flower, and uh, it can stay or you can get rid of it. All right, and if it stays and it blooms, they can send us a pic. And yeah, we'll know it would sure. be a little easier yeah. once you see the flowers on that. All right, three pictures on this next one. Uh, very prolific if it's allowed to go to seed. And I think there's <clears throat> one that, yeah, that one that shows the flower buds. Yeah, I think with this one, uh, one year of seed is seven years of weeding. So <laughs> if you don't get it before it seeds, they fly all over the place and you're going to get it uh, everywhere. So it's a uh, sow thistle. Uh, either a spiny sow thistle or a common sow thistle, and they're an annual. Sometimes they are perennial and they can spread underground, but I would assume this one is the annual that's going to spread uh, quite perfectly. So make sure you get it before it seeds out. All right, and one more, and it's it is, what is this big old strange plant in front of the canna lilies? Uh, I like to call it buttonweed, velvet leaf. So that is a weed, and same thing with this one. It's going to have seeds in that uh, capsule that it's creating and they'll dry out and then they'll shake and you can spread them all over when you pull it when it's dry. So make sure you do it before that stage, uh, just rogue it out. All right, excellent. Two pictures on your first one, Lauren. This is from Albion, uh, hail damage. The cukes now have these lesions, are they doomed? Uh, I think this is actually downy mildew on this one. Um, that can be fairly devastating, so uh, you really want to be careful with the high temperatures, but if they're, they want to maintain this cucumber crop, you really need to be careful on the product you use because of the pre-harvest interval. Mm -hmm. um, and something that could work in this case would be chlorothalonil. All right, uh, three pictures on this next one. It's moon glow pears, uh, eight feet apart. One is doing fine, the other has a lot of black leaves on it. And, and this looks a lot like fire blight, mm -hmm. but from the description and looking closely, some of the leaf petioles look curved. And I, I know they indicated no pesticide drift and that, that looks a lot like fire blight, but some of the images didn't look like the whole tree was being impacted by that. Mm -hmm. So if you see dead shoots, you could prune those out. But I would, I think in this particular case, I would wait just from what I saw in the distribution and the way there was new green growth growing on some of those black shoots, which would not be indicative of fire blight. All right, um, next one is rust and scab on a Bradford pear. In Soresco, anything to do mm -hmm. now or is it too late? Uh, nothing to do now. Uh, next year in that um, mid-May, early June window, you could look at a treatment. Right, and this one is the uh, same. same thing. This is from Hebron. Same thing. All right, Sarah, you have uh, two pictures on this first one. And this is a 75-year-old honey locust. Looks fine, but then found a kind of this wound in it and it looks kind of strange. She's, she says it's not oozing and the hole doesn't seem to go beyond a couple of inches. Should she just, what should she do about this? Just Nothing, just yeah. leave it alone. Looks like maybe an old pruning wound that didn't seal properly. You could, you could check it periodically, maybe once a year or so, to, just to see if it's, wood is getting soft, if there's an extensive wood rot in there. But at this point, it doesn't look like it's a huge issue for the tree. All right, and one picture on this one. This is a Fairmont viewer. Uh, this birch, last year it had leaves, and this year it only has half of them. Yeah, I'm suspecting that this is probably some winter damage from the, the dry conditions we had last winter. Um, and those branches at the top are dead. So what I would do at this point is prune those out. I would make sure you have a nice three inch layer of mulch around the base. It looks like this tree may be in kind of a lower maintenance area. Um, I, would, I would do some serious <coughs> deep watering for the rest of the summer. 
and see if we can't get that tree to uh, regain a little bit of vigor and maybe make a comeback. All right, and two picks on this next one. This is a Hastings viewer that bought a 20-foot tall double trunk river birch and only half of it is alive. They're wondering, should they cut that out and be done with it or let that little sprout at the base turn into a tree? Um, it's not likely that that little sprout will develop into a good, well-attached trunk um, because, well, there's a lot of reasons why. I, I would not do that. I would cut out the dead trunk and just let this be a single trunk tree. All right, and two pictures on this next one. This is a Seward County baseball-sized hail. Austrian and ponderosas are brown on the west and north. Uh, anything they can do about this so we're, then keep them healthy. We're seeing a lot of these evergreens from western Nebraska that had, had hail damage with, with injury like this. So a common disease that we see in these pines called diploidia, which usually causes a shoot, a shoot death in the spring and early summer, can also colonize the branches and cause cankers and then cause more extensive branch dieback. So this is probably diploidia following hail uh, injury on these branches. Unfortunately, there isn't anything you can do about it now. Um, I would wait maybe until next spring and see what new growth you get. It's doubtful that these brown branches will put out any new growth. Um, and so if that's the case, you'll just have to prune them out. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, buying a tree can be expensive, so you wanna make sure what, what you bring home has had the best care it can get. A relatively new technique is using grow bags instead of plastic pots. Sheldon Garcia from Mulhall's Nursery in Omaha explains why a cloth grow bag is a better way to produce a young tree. So grow bags are a uh, somewhat new thing in the tree industry. Um, we started actually producing our trees and grow bags uh, starting last year. Uh, we're continuing that and we have switched over 100% to grow bag production. So the reason why we chose grow bags or, or why grow bags are used versus hard side plastic containers is to prevent the tree's roots from girdling. Uh, because it has a porous sidewall rather than a smooth plastic sidewall. Um, when, with that, the root tip gets trapped in the side of the bag. Uh, the root tip will then die and create a more dense fibrous root system behind it, just like if you were to prune uh, the head of a tree. Um, whereas in a plastic container, once that root tip hits the side of the container wall, it's going to turn and it's going to keep circling and circling, eventually choking out the tree. Another benefit of the grow bags uh, versus the hard wall containers is you have a higher chance of success while planting in uh, hotter temperatures like in July uh, or August um, because you don't have to prep the root system as much as a hard wall container. Uh, you just cut the bag, rip it off the roots, and it's ready to go in the ground. Whereas a hard wall container, you'd have to take the container off and kind of shave off one inch about one inch off the side of that ball to give it new root growth uh, outwards. Uh, another benefit of using a grow bag tree versus a hard wall plastic container tree um, is you're gonna get a healthier tree by using less resources. Uh, these guys don't require as much water, mainly from the dense root system. They have all those root tips that are able to absorb the nutrients and the water versus the big thick roots that get developed on a hard wall container. So if you are out looking for a tree uh, to add to your yard uh, or your business um, and you see a tree in a grow bag, don't be worried. This is actually more beneficial than a hard wall uh, container. There's really nothing worse than paying a lot of money for a new tree and then to watch it struggle after uh, you've planted it. So grow bags can really help you get that tree off to the right start. You know, you can see this and many other features and programs on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. Take a few minutes after the show, check it out, and while you're there, hit that subscribe button to make sure you get all the latest content. We do announcements, of course, of great things going on in the gardening world. Our very first one that Terry mentioned is East Campus Discovery Days this Saturday, 10 to 2. Lots of fun, even though it'll be hot. You can have ice cream or something. And then we are going on the road. So Backyard Pharma will be live at Vallis Pumpkin Patch Monday, August 22nd. Q&A at 4.15, the show at 5 p.m. And then we are going to the fair again, and that will be Backyard Farmer Live on Monday, August 29th in the Raising Nebraska building. Q&A at 5.15, the 
show at six. So come cheer us on for our 70th birthday. All right, so we're gonna go quickly through here if we can. Uh, two pictures on this first one, Kyle, and this is Underwood, Iowa. He's wondering, is the first one a painted lady? And he's wondering what the second one is. Um, not a painted lady, it's a silver spotted skipper. The second one is an eastern tailed blue. Eastern tail blue, cool. And then two pictures on this next one. This comes to us from Omaha. Tiny insect with a leg and she said no head. <laughs> I think there's a head there somewhere. But. Yeah, the head is, is actually the side that's facing down. Um, so they, they kind of stand in that position. Um, and this would be one of the grass veneers, like a, a sod webworm, the adult of, of those. So they're pretty ubiquitous. All right, and one more, and this is uh, just for fun. We had a picture of a tomato worm that had the parasitic wasp pupa, and he wanted us just to see what happened to the <laughs> what happened to the caterpillar. So that would be a former caterpillar. Yep, that's a former caterpillar. <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, two pictures on this one. Uh, this is uh, weeds from a cemetery, and this is Rembrandt, Iowa. He wonders what this particular grassy weed is. So I think we have maybe one more picture yeah, on this one. To me, it just looks almost like smooth broom, mm -hmm. uh, and that can invade those uh, grassy areas, Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, especially when they go dormant. This can take off from the rhizomes and uh, do a little bit better than some of those cool season grasses. All right. Um, he did do use a pre-merge. And then your next three pictures are, he wonders if this is nimble will. <coughs> this is Omaha. So he, uh, he did try to use uh, a safe roundup for weeds, but... He yep. said it didn't work. Yeah, it is nimble will, and the, the round, Roundup for Weeds has nothing in there that'll control nimble will. Uh, really, the only thing that controls it is killing off the whole area with the non selective like glyphosate, or there's one product called Tenacity that works, and you can actually start applying it here in August. Uh, it usually takes two to three applications, though. Uh, so read the label on that. That uh, is one product that you can selectively take it out. All right, and then the last one here is this plant under ponderosa pines. Simple to rogue out, but very quick to grow. And is there a pre-merge? Uh, dayflower, Asiatic dayflower. And yes, it does spread quickly from the nodes. It roots down, but pre-emergence really do not work well with this. So it's post, post is probably the best thing or pulling it out. All right, excellent. Brock declared that a nice ornamental flower. He yeah, did. it does look nice. Nice Good ground, ground cover. cover. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Lauren, two picks on this one. This actually, they saw this in Traverse City, Michigan. Beautiful. This is a chicken of the woods or sulfur shelf mushroom. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more advanced, so it's extended out. I think they ask if it's edible or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to recommend to eat it. You can read about that, uh, but this is considered edible, but it's too far advanced in this stage. It would be tough. All right, uh, two picks on this next <clears> one. This is an Aurora viewer, and uh, this is a, a viburnum that had boars, and the nursery said cut it back, and then here came this. Yeah, and that's just, I, I think you've got some canker activity in this mm -hmm. case. That might have been a boar site where you've mm -hmm. got uh, some activity where uh, something else has come in and grown in that opening. All right, and one on this one, this is, uh, she says she sprayed this, that cedar that tree and she, all she gets is the spots and the rots and yeah and so all the leaves on this uh, I believe this was a flowering crab mm -hmm. uh, these are leaves that are dropping due to scab uh, mm -hmm. scab has been pretty heavy this year and uh, nothing to do at this point it usually won't kill the tree if it's a mature tree I wouldn't worry about it all right Sarah uh, Aurora tomato fertilizer on this very first one she put on the fertilizer and then this happened have you ever seen this before I don't think this is the fertilizer. There's a condition we get in tomatoes called physiological leaf roll, which is due to hot, dry weather. And I think that's what you've got there. Once the leaves roll, though, they don't typically unroll very well. So it'll probably stay like this until you get new growth. All right, two picks on this next one, a black one and a red one. And they uh, wonder whether they are edible and good to eat. You know, from this second picture, they both look like they're very edible. Um, so I'm a little stumped on this one. I, I'm thinking maybe maybe one of the plants was mislabeled and they actually got a dark burgundy or black colored cherry tomato and there are some of those out there. All right, and quickly on this next one, Fremont and then Norfolk, what are what is this on tomatoes? This is fruit cracking, which is very common in hot, dry weather. Um, you can cut around the cracks and eat the tomato if you want to. Um, the second one is called cat facing. It's a pollination issue, which occurs again when Conditions are hot and dry, but the fruit is still edible again. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks all. And